So in this video, we're going to look at our next topic, which is heat and temperature. So this is chapter 10 in your book, and we're just going to do an introduction today. We're going to look at the basics of what is the difference between heat and temperature, and what are the different scales used to measure temperature. And we might look at the different types of thermometer as well, and also what is absolute zero. So uh, what's the difference between heat and temperature? Well, I'll just give you the definitions first, and then we'll, we'll talk about them a little bit more. So the definition for heat is heat is a form of energy. And energy, as you know, is measured in joules. The definition for temperature, which you must know because they do ask this, is temperature measures how hot or how cold an object is, and it's measured in degrees Celsius or Kelvin, capital K. And I'll explain the difference between degrees Celsius or Kelvin today. And you would have, you'd have heard already in America, and they like to use uh, degrees Fahrenheit instead of Celsius. So what's the difference? Well, here's something to think about when you're thinking about the difference between heat and temperature. You could have a giant iceberg, which as you know, is definitely at zero degrees Celsius or below it, and it would have more heat energy than a hot cup of tea. So how can an iceberg have more heat energy than a hot cup of tea? Well, it's got to do with what heat energy actually is. If we looked at a cube of ice and we looked at it at a molecular level and we looked at all its atoms, what we notice is they're vibrating. So any solid or any all particles are constantly vibrating and moving. And if we have a solid like an ice cube, the particles are arranged like this picture here and all of those particles are vibrating about a point. So they're here but they're vibrating back and forth about this point. Now if I heat up this ice cube, what happens to those vibrations? Well, they start to vibrate more and more rapidly. We're giving them more and more energy. We're giving them more heat energy, so they vibrate more. Likewise, if I cool them down, what happens? Well, they vibrate less and less and less. So because zero degrees isn't the coldest possible temperature we know, at zero degrees, they still have some heat energy. So the particles are still vibrating. But if we cool them down to minus 50 degrees Celsius, they'll be vibrating less. Minus 100 degrees Celsius, they'll be vibrating less again. So heat energy, I suppose, is it's the, it's the accumulation or the measurement of all the kinetic energies of all these particles. So when we go back to the ice cube and the cup of tea, because there's billions and billions and billions more particles in the ice cube, and we add up the billions and billions and billions of vibrations of all of those particles, there's actually more heat energy in this ice cube than there is in a cup of tea because there's so many particles. So all those vibrations added together, all those kinetic energies added together are more than the even more rapid kinetic energies of the cup of tea particles because there's less of them. So that's the kind of difference, but that's what heat energy is. It's the addition of all the kinetic energies of all these particles. So something can have heat energy, even if we kind of describe it as being cold, like ice. Um, remember, zero degrees is just the temperature that we set for, because it's a kind of a, a lower boundary in, in the kind of everyday temperatures that we see on, on Earth. So this kind of brings the question, how cold can you go? Well, you imagine I had a balloon filled with particles and I put it over a, a trough of boiling water that boiling water is going to heat those particles and give them energy. So because they have energy, they're going to all move around very rapidly. And because they move around very rapidly, there's going to be a high pressure in the balloon. And because there's a high pressure, it means they're bouncing off the walls a lot, there'll also be a high volume. Now, if that water cools down over time, the particles will cool down. Or if we add ice, the particles will cool down. And what we'll get is we'll get a lower pressure and therefore a lower volume. So a French physicist known as Amontan actually used this to kind of try and figure out, well, how, how cold can you go? And based on our description of what heat is, there's no heat energy once these particles are no longer vibrating. So what he did was, he didn't use a balloon and boiling water, he used slightly more advanced um, equipment than that. He measured the volume of an amount of air at zero degrees Celsius 
and he heated it up then to say 20 and he measured the volume and just like I explained there'd be higher pressure so higher volume and he kept going he did it at 40 and he got a higher volume 60 he got a higher volume and the, the higher the temperature the greater that volume of air or the greater that pressure and what he noticed was there's a relationship here and he said well if I work backwards sorry about these lines I don't know how to get rid of them if I work backwards I can estimate What's the coldest possible temperature? When does something have zero energy? And he called that temperature absolute zero. It is the temperature that something no longer has any heat energy. And to this day, scientists have never actually achieved absolute zero in labs or on Earth. They cannot get something to be that cold. They've got very, very close, but they haven't got there. And absolute zero turns out, oh, there's the actual line. Absolute zero, it turns out, is in and around minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. So absolute zero is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, and you definitely need to know those numbers. Now he said, well, why are we using degrees Celsius as a scale if zero degrees Celsius isn't actually zero? So what he did is he came up with a new scale, his own scale, which he called the Kelvin scale. And zero Kelvin is the bottom of the Kelvin scale, or absolute zero. And zero Kelvin is equal to minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. So if you wanted to find out what zero degrees Celsius would be, well, it would be 100 Kelvin, because we'd have to add uh, 100 onto 275.15 degrees Celsius. So it would be... Um, what am I saying? Minus 173.15 degrees Celsius. And uh, the thing about the Kelvin, one Kelvin is actually equal to one degree Celsius. So what I mean by that is if you go up by one Kelvin, you are going up by one degree Celsius. So they have the same kind of intervals, but we just say zero Kelvin is absolute zero, but that's minus 273 degrees Celsius. So if a gas is cooled enough, the particles stop moving. This is not zero energy, but the lowest amount of energy possible. And I'll explain that not zero energy in another topic, but that's not really relevant. This has got to do with mass kind of storing energy. This is absolute zero, and it's minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. The Kelvin temperature scale starts at absolute zero. One Kelvin is one degree Celsius. Now the rule you want to know uh, for converting between the two of them is the temperature in degrees Celsius is equal to the temperature in Kelvin minus 273.15. So for example, if I centigrade is degrees Celsius, if I know the temperature in degrees Celsius and I want to find the temperature in Kelvin, I rearrange this equation to give me the temperature in Kelvin is equal to the temperature in degrees Celsius plus 273.15. So if I want to figure out the temperature in Kelvin here, I add it on. So it'd be 273 plus 273. Sorry, oh, I think something's after going wrong there. That should be, there should be a minus in front of this. Sorry, those lines, that should be minus 273. Um, so minus 273.15 plus 273.15. Now in this table, I've left out the 0.15, but what I'd like you to do is basically, if you know what, if you have 180 degrees Kelvin, I'd like you to pause this video now and figure it out in degrees Celsius using these two rules. That one and the bottom one. And sorry again, it's messy because of all those lines. If you know what 273 degrees Kelvin is, can you figure out what that is in degrees Celsius? 100 degrees Celsius, what's that in Kelvin? And what's 1300 Kelvin in degrees Celsius using these rules? As I said, I've left out the 0.15, but technically you should add them in. So pause the video and try that, and then I'll give you the answers now in a second. Okay, so the answers are minus 93, 0, 373, and 1027. Remember, yours, if you've included the 0.15, this might be 1026.85, so be slightly off. So that's absolute zero. Now I'm gonna send you a video that I'd like you to watch on this as well, a short three minute video on the history of the absolute zero, which explains it really well.
And all I'd like you to do today is make notes on this work. Uh, actually, we'll, we'll do a little bit more. We'll just do one, one small bit more. So also we could learn today what is a thermometric property and what are examples of these thermometric properties. And then there is a mandatory experiment with this, which we won't be able to do until we go back to school. So a thermometric property is basically a variable that moves up and down predictably with temperature. So for example, thermometers. We have a thermometer here and it's full of liquid. When that liquid is heated, the, it expands. And when it expands, it fills up the column a bit more and therefore it moves up the column by a certain amount. Now the amount that it expands by is predictable. It will always expand by the same amount if you increase the temperature by 20 degrees or 40 degrees, or if you decrease the temperature by 20 degrees or 40 degrees. And because it's predictable, we can use it to measure temperature. We can use it to make thermometers. So this is what a term thermometric property is. It's a physical property that changes measurably and repeatedly with a temperature change. So it's always the same. It'll always go up. This, this liquid will always expand by the same amount if I increase the temperature by 40 degrees, if I add on 40 degrees. There's a couple of different examples of thermometric properties that you need to learn. First of all, you need to know that definition and you need to know the four examples of thermometric properties. One of them is volume. And that's the one we've just talked about. The next one is actually the color of certain crystals. Certain crystals change color depending on the temperature. And you might have seen, we have this little bit of kid in school, and you probably use that junior cert, that you put this, these crystals in hot water and they change color. And at 40 degrees Celsius, they might be red. And then at 50 degrees Celsius, they might be white and so on. They change color depending on the temperature. And the last thing you won't know too much about, just what you remember from junior research, is electrical resistance, where it gets harder for current to flow through a wire if the temperature is higher. And you might have come across um, thermistors or heat-dependent resistors in junior research. We'll meet them again in this course, so when, once we do electricity, but their resistance changes depending on the temperature. And we use them in things like our... Um, immersion heaters and kettles and things like that. Okay, I'm going to send you another video clip on thermometers, another short one, and then that's the end of today's lesson. So make notes on this PowerPoint, watch the two videos, make notes, and I'll give you the reference pages from your textbook as well.